So I am uh, Stephen Wilkins. I'm the director of the uh, Macmillan Center. Uh, I know that many of you uh, have been here today to our inaugural European Studies Graduate Fellows Network Conference. So Macmillan's uh, really pleased to host and support this event, which includes students as well as uh, faculty discussants from 10 different institutions uh, from uh, throughout the world. And we're particularly pleased to be including people from five institutions in the International Alliance for Research Universities uh, Network, and we hope to do more with the Alliance in the future. And so uh, I know this is ongoing. Uh, thank you for coming, and, and we're very glad to have you. So uh, today I've got the pleasure of introducing uh, Ambassador uh, Milica Pajanovic uh, Durisic, who is the ambassador of uh, Montenegro to the uh, United Nations. So uh, academics are very good at one thing, typically. They've, we've been hired to research something, and uh, that doesn't necessarily mean, as anybody uh, in academic administration knows, that we're very good at uh, other things. Uh, but uh, uh, the ambassador is really an exception to that rule. She uh, had a very distinguished career, has had a very distinguished career in uh, telecom engineering. She has a PhD in that field. She continues. Uh, even as ambassador to supervise uh, graduate students uh, in that field from uh, her perch in uh, the UN. But she's always been a publicly engaged uh, intellectual, uh, active in politics while she was active in academia. And so she's managed uh, very adroitly to combine both of those uh, specialties uh, throughout uh, her career. She helped to usher in the internet uh, age to Montenegro, being uh, president of the board uh, of uh, the first internet uh, provider in Montenegro. She uh, has also had uh, a position of uh, Minister of Defense for several uh, years. So it's really a highly unusual career from both the academic perspective and from the international policy, uh, policy practitioner perspective. And I was talking with her earlier, and she thinks that the one side helps to be better at the other. Uh, that having that academic grounding enables you to take a certain distance from the policy uh, side of things, to not get completely invested in that, and also on the other side, perhaps thinking about the broader policy side uh, also uh, helps you to be a better academic. So today she's uh, going to speak to us on contemporary uh, security challenges uh, for Europe. There are certainly plenty of them. And we're really delighted to have the ambassador here to help us uh, navigate that territory. So welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm really glad to be a part of um, the conference here. And uh, I want to thank, of course, for the very kind introduction I got here this afternoon and where you could see that um, I am really someone who is trying to combine uh, two very, I would say, not always very distant possibilities offered with my academic background and with uh, my involvement and public engagements. Uh, it was probably possible because I'm coming from a relatively small country where actually we've got to be very careful about um, the resources and the way how we engage ourselves. And uh, that my engagement uh, came as somehow consequence of all the changes we did have at the end of 80s, when a lot of people from university and from academic community thought that we might help contribute to the changes which were necessary in our region by our expertise, knowledge, and uh, the willingness to be a part of the changes. A lot of people, of course, got disappointed in that way because, as you all might suppose, politics is uh, very much different from what we are doing in academia and it needs um, a lot of patience, a lot of perseverance to stay. And uh, I've chosen to stay in a way to be involved with the things which I perceived to be important for my country. And that's why I used to call myself a kind of a project-based politician. And that's why I was always involved in projects that were 
much larger than myself or the country, like preserving the peace in Montenegro when everything started at the beginning of 90s, like uh, making a distinction in comparison with the very bad politics in our region, by fighting for regaining independence of Montenegro, which we did in 2006, and by working very hard for uh, getting to the Montenegro membership in NATO. So these were the projects I thought were very, very important, and that's why I got engaged in that part of um, the activities. So when I got the invitation to be a part of the conference here today, I thought what might be the topic. Of course, I could be talking to you about something uh, I'm actually very much involved as the ambassador of Montenegro in UN, and which is somewhere at the crossroads of uh, my expertise and my experiences, and which deals with cybersecurity. But then I thought that maybe we can do that another time, following what is the main topic of the conference, which is going on today and tomorrow. And we decided that I might give you a kind of um, overview of what is um, the security situation in Europe nowadays. So starting from the fact that we are all witnessing the fact that actually the whole world is changing and um, that Europe is facing a very complex and uncertain security environment, we will all very much agree, I believe, that for decades in the last century, 20th century, actually after the end of the Second World War, European security generally was structured around that East-West conflict, which we called Cold War, containing itself disputes both between and within the two blocs. Then the fall of Berlin Wall unleashed these brutal conflicts related with the outbreak of Yugoslavia in the first place, forcing the principal political security institutions to adapt to such challenges. Once this situation came into the peaceful phase, the main institutions in charge of the European security landscape were the ones, actually, uh, which we could say um, OSCE, European Union, NATO, UN also partially, and they mainly been focused from that time on, on issues related with threats on spots which were outside our particular <coughs> continent, in Afghanistan, Middle East, Africa. And while that was certainly very much justified, what has not been foreseen at the that time were fundamental changes in the international security environment driven by power transitions among states, as well as power diffusions from governments to non-state actors worldwide. These developments have created a kind of strategic shock, resulting in increasing instability within the whole post-Cold War world order. They also contributed towards greater public discontent and increasing challenges to governance in many European states, what in itself causes degradation of the whole European security and introduces disturbing elements when it comes to the vision of Europe whole, free, and at peace. In such circumstances, a growing demand is articulated in Europe, within European Union at the first place, towards becoming a more capable, more coherent, and more strategic global actor. In doing so, a comprehensive approach is a key to tackle this complex, multi-actor, and multi-dimensional crisis and growing security threats, contemporary and future ones. As the whole world is transforming in multiple areas at an exponential rate, the international order that Europeans helped build has come under great pressure with the increasing competition between the great powers and new security threats, including terrorism and cyber attacks, as well as climate change. An element we have to take into consideration while analyzing security in Europe and elsewhere 
is the fact that many of the changes, political, social, economical, environmental, are substantially influenced and driven by the rapid development of technologies. <coughs> Such confluence of political, socioeconomic, and technological trends is actually redefining the security context globally and in Europe, <coughs> resulting in complexity, uncertainty, and even disorder. In the interconnected world, geotechnology as positioning of countries in regard to complex technology environment could be considered today as a substitute to geopolitics in the 19th and 20th century as new technologies will do much more than just transform science and research. They will determine how we all live and function and it is quite clear that the race for technological re leadership among the world's powers will be an important part of the global order's transformation. Those countries that crea can create and implement cutting edge technologies while being able to adapt to those technologies at the same time will realize enormous economic and geostrategical benefits in decades to come. As the international competition, competition for the redistribution of power is having a tendency of intensifying, the main serious breakdown in that sense happened in 2014. Despite all legal conventions, political agreements, security instruments, and institutions being in place, the crisis in Ukraine escalated into a conflict resulting in the illegal annexation of Crimea and Russia's intervention in Eastern Ukraine. This was the first time after the Second World War that one country seized another's territory in Europe. More assertive Rus Russia led towards the increased unpredictability we are facing, marked not only with the Ukraine crisis, but also with trying to influence political processes and deliberately interference in elections to cyber attacks on European companies and systems, investing in modern military equipment, including in new intermediate range missiles, which led to the demise of the INF Treaty. There is no doubt that this crisis created new momentum in working on competition in political, economic, and military realms. Europe has responded in a united and very firm way. The European Union has stood firm in its use of economic sanctions, while NATO has implementing the largest reinforcement of its collective defense since the end of the Cold War, demonstrating to Russia the consequences of violating international law. On arms control and the demise of the INF Treaty, NATO further demonstrates its strength and unity by supporting the United States decision to withdraw from the treaty, remaining committed to effective arms control, disarmament, and non-proliferation. At the same time, while European Union is extending regularly the sanctions, NATO continues to combine meaningful dialogue with credible deterrence and defense with the aspiration to have a dialogue, but a meaningful one, with Russia and to build more constructive relationship, rebuilding trust where possible. In addition to these security threats from its east, Europe is also facing challenges from its south borders as well, particularly international <coughs> terrorism, but also the migration that increasingly challenges Europe's security and even its solidarity. After the big migration wave in 2015, a lack of effective policies or even lack of national intent to provide equal opportunity to integrate migrants into society led towards frustration among both migrants and the local population. Apart from creating financial and social strain, these pose security concerns as public discontent and polarization is on the rise with a significant lack of trust in governments and institutions. Thus new and old populist movements are gaining more power in Europe, having anti-government and anti-globalization agenda, 
threatening cohesion and capabilities of European Union and NATO as well. Still, this particular issue has to be addressed primarily at national levels, and it is encouraging that the recent elections for European Parliament showed a certain positive results in that sense. When it comes to European counter-terrorist efforts, the transatlantic partnership plays a crucial role as through NATO countries have been engaged in the US-led global coalition in the fight against ISIS, liberating vast territory and millions of people in Iraq and Syria. In Afghanistan, the joint military presence supports the Afghan security forces so they can create the conditions for peace. As the situation in northern East Syria remains difficult, it has been agreed among all partners to safeguard the gains and maintain the commitment to missions and operations in the region, <coughs> including NATO straight training missions in Iraq and Afghanistan and the process for finding a political solution to the crisis in Syria, which is led by UN. With the evident redistribution of economic and military power to towards Asia, notably the rise of China and the pace of technological change, it is one of the priorities for Europe to consolidate its position while working more to understand and respond to such geostrategical landscape. China will soon have the world's largest economy. Economic power alone is not sufficient to define the global balance of power, but economic strength is the foundation also for military power. China already has the second largest defense budget in the world, investing heavily in new cap capabilities. It increased its presence from the Arctic to the Balkans and in cyberspace, including its major investments in infrastructure in Europe. It has hundreds of missiles with a range that would have been prohibited by the INF Treaty. China is becoming a global leader in the development of new technology, from 5G to facial recognition, and from quantum computing to gathering vast amount of global data. That is why it is important to understand what the scope of China's influence means for security of Europe and the whole West. Climate change is drawing great attention as it impacts all domains, shaping also the security environment in many ways, putting a pressure on individuals and governments. Nations have to improve their resilience by addressing adaptation measures so that effective governance would be ensured, including prevention of new inequalities, mitigation of natural disasters impacts, and consequently new migrations and displacements. To that end, understanding civil and military vulnerabilities to climate disturbances in the key supply and distribution systems is required as a prerequisite for improving sustainment and developed <coughs> resilience in Europe. All these described dynamics certainly challenge European security structures to bring balance, ensure their position and influence, keeping its citizens safe. Obtaining the required level of security in Europe definitely will be a long process, and it is up to policymakers to design an evolved architecture that will be agreed upon and then implemented efficiently. In that process, each of the security institution has its own role, and it is of the utmost importance to avoid any competition or overlap between them. That is something which should be high on the agenda of European Union at the first place, while a process of closer cooperation, security, and defense will be put in place. EU member states agreed, actually, to step up the European Union's work in this area and acknowledge the need to enhance cooperation increase investment and um, for more cooperation in developing defense capabilities through so-called permanent structured cooperation on security and defense with the acronym PESCO. It is meant to be a treaty-based framework with the legally binding nature of the commitments undertaken by the participating member states. For the time being, it's 23 of them who signed 
agreement for this uh, framework. Actually, the aim is to jointly develop defense capabilities and make them available for EU military operations. In this manner, the EU's capacity as an international security actor would be enhanced, contributing to the protection of EU citizens and maximizing actually the effectiveness of overall defense spendings. And there have been a lot of discussions if this new EU security cooperation instrument will weaken already challenged NATO alliance, which has been a bedrock of transatlantic security for 70 years, proved to be the most successful defense alliance in the history, representing half of the world's economic might and half of the world's military might. The dominant argu argument is that PESCO and NATO will produce significant strategic divergences on either side of the Atlantic and ultimately weaken both US and EU military capabilities against potential adversaries. Moreover, as the two main obstacles to further EU integration in security and defense are continuing political divisions with regard to the identification of threats and foreign policy priorities and the Union's military weaknesses. Concerns over sovereignty, trust, technical, bureaucratic and financial hurdles and defense industry issues complicate this scenario. However, efforts have been made to explain that these two arrangements should be seen as complementary to each other rather than as opposing forces. Indeed, if implemented well, European defense initiatives such as PESCO could address the precise U.S. ask for a stronger European pillar within NATO. Greater European defense spending would be welcomed, as well investments in military capabilities and enhancement of operational readiness and PESCO could be a very positive instrument from a transatlantic perspective enhancing capabilities and burden sharing within the same NATO. In the same context as NATO celebrated its 70th anniversary with the London meeting the other day that we all were following and maybe where we haven't been very much encouraged what we heard and what we saw, I've got to say that um, what counts at the end is what uh, has been agreed and the record wasn't that bad as the media picture was. So uh, first of all, it was announced everything about the details of large increases in defense spending, proving the rise in awareness and commitment towards modifying and enhancing capabilities required for NATO mission of defense and deterrence. So in 2019, defense spending across European allies and Canada increased in real terms by 4.6%, making this the fifth consecutive year of growth. And by the end of the next year, those allies will have invested something like 130 billion more since 2016. Based on the latest estimates, the accumulated increase in defense spending by the end of uh, 2024 will be something like 400 billion, what is something which uh, really represents uh, a change we never <coughs> seen up to now when it comes to investment is defense as a such. And also more allies are meeting the guideline of spending 2% of GDP for defense. And this year it was nine allies which met the guideline up from just three allies a year ago. So actually that is something which is very important when it comes to the outcomes uh, of the meetings which were the other day together with the full uh, commitment of all the allies when it comes to NATO readiness initiatives where they all committed to provide all necessary resources and capabilities to NATO readiness forces where a lot of that were missing beforehand. I remember the time when I was around the table and when uh, it was, of course, after all the crisis with Ukraine started 
and when we were go, uh, working on all these analyses, which showed at the time, and it wasn't long ago, it was just three years ago, that uh, these nature readiness forces actually uh, just cause like that. It was shown, for example, that for a force of a nature to be uh, just um, transported from, say, Spain to some of the Baltic countries, it would be needed something like a week or two. So Redden is just in the name. Nowadays, in the last three years, Allies did make uh, significant progress, and I believe that they shown on the meeting in London these days with all this number they provided, that it is something they are really devoted, it's a serious business, and they are, at the end, uh, very much committing the resources they are having to our uh, transatlantic alliance. So, as we all do know, probably we were having at some time a tendency to ignore the fact that freedom and security do not come for free. All this what is a development could be considered as a very positive news, no matter all these disagreements and differences or probably some divisions which uh, we are witnessing over trade, energy, climate change, Iran, northern Syria. I do believe that uh, NATO is um, such kind of organization where all these serious discussions could be led and where actually by putting on the table even different positions, they could be coming out with um, the unity and solidarity when it comes to the core tasks of the Alliance. And of course, having the full picture um, around us, um, I do know that uh, as more as um, we are informed as more as we are thinking about these things, as more as we are analyzing, it is not that easy to be that much optimistic when we are looking at the world. And uh, as we are actually witnessing uh, the emergence of these new powers, economically, politically, and militarily, it is definitely a time where shifts are happening uh, very fast and uh, the world is becoming increasingly unpredictable and interlinked as a such. So the Ukrainian crisis has shown us and somehow reopened issues that we thought that were closed completely for over on European ground. A fragility of just uh, reconsolidated and reconstructed Western Balkans, for example, as well as spreading instability in the Middle East and North Africa, add all to the volume of uncertainty influencing European security context as such. So I also would like to use this opportunity to draw your attention to the point that the journey of having Europe whole, free and at peace has not yet been completed. There are still young and fragile democracies in the southern part of European context continent, which have through their integration processes made their political commitment to contribute in European security and prosperity. At the same time, these countries are also at the front line of emerging security threats and challenges. Having all this in mind, we can actually make a conclusion that is of the uttermost importance to reinforce cooperation and joint efforts of NATO and EU at the first place in continuing to keep citizens of Europe safe. As potential implications of the ongoing transition in developing responses to impending risks are better recognized, collaborative adaptation of European security architecture should be the way ahead to prevent negative trends by staying committed to the core values, while NATO should continue to provide the main framework for collective defense of the whole Euro-Atlantic region. By that kind of statement, I would like to finish this part and I've got to thank you and um, of course uh, ask you for whatever your interest might be in uh, this issue as I am more than willing to have a discussion with you. Thank you.
Can I? Mm -hmm. Thank you for brilliant presentation. It was really interesting. Uh, my name is Maria Snigovaya. I'm a postdoc fellow at Johns Hopkins University, and I work on uh, uh, European Union and Russia's unfortunate impact on it these days. I have two questions. So first of all, you were talking about cooperation and strengthening of NATO, which are quite remarkable uh, and commendable. Uh, could you please comment on the recent actions and statements of the French President uh, Macron about who blocked uh, the EU expansion into the Balkans and, of course, the famous uh, NATO brain death comment. And the second one, and I apologize for that maybe basic question, if you could clarify the necessity for independent EU initiatives like PESCO, right, independent of NATO, what are they achieving that NATO cannot? Why do, why do they need it? Thank you. Well, I expected the question about the brain dead nature, which um, has provoked a lot of reactions and I would say uh, startled a lot of people because no one expected something like that. Uh, we have seen that it was um, on the table at the uh, latest NATO meeting in London as well and uh, that President Macron was put in a position to explain what he actually meant. What I do believe is that um, he wanted to give a kind of a new momentum in what is adaptation of NATO to the contemporary threats and challenges. So, of course, as in every organization, especially those multilateral ones, there is always a need to go forward and to actually adapt to the world, as we said, which is so quickly changing. And um, why NATO was so successful is this, in these 70 years? I mean, NATO was the one who ensured peace in Europe after the Second World War. That was the alliance together with, of course, European Union that helped in putting aside all the divergences and all the things, horrible things that were happening in two war, uh, world wars in Europe. Of course, the second one being just a kind of a second act of the first one, which hasn't been completed actually. So from that point, I do believe that uh, we should be thinking about his position as a call for further adaptation and for further frank discussions, what and how should be done. So from that point, uh, as I said to you already, before Ukraine crisis, NATO was a kind of, uh, of course, dealing with the spots we were outside Europe, as it's very important to have the stability on its eastern, on its southern flank, or on its northern flank as well. So these were the priorities. But when Ukraine happened, it was obvious that everyone was a little bit too much relaxed, expecting that never something like that could happen. And NATO adapted very quickly. So from that point, I do believe that even now, when uh, President Macron is calling for this kind of discussions, it might be only something very good for NATO, because we already did have a result of that, and the result is that uh, the leaders agreed to have a kind of uh, high-level panel, which will be chaired by the Secretary General, Mr. Stoltenberg, and where actually they will be having uh, uh, working debates on what next should be done so that NATO would be ready for all the challenges in front of us, as, uh, as globally, I mean. Uh, another thing where uh, it is showed how NATO is nowadays able to respond very quickly is the fact that due to all developments we had in uh, the last five years, uh, the number of operational domains changed. So just a couple of years ago, it was land, sea, and the air. Nowadays, we've got cyber, and the newly one, we've got space. So that all means how well all these things were recognized there and how quickly NATO is able to adapt its missions to what might be threatening peace and security. When it comes to integration, of course, and the further enlargement towards Western Balkans, which uh, uh, the enlargement as a such has proved in the last 30 years as the most efficient instrument for consolidating new democracies, especially those who uh, were part of the Warsaw Pact and then those who were part of the ex-Yugoslavia and who went through all these atrocities we went through. So, uh, of course, that the region wasn't very much satisfied or wasn't satisfied at all with these kind of comments. But on the other side, 
I also perceive that uh, President Macron wanted to put forward the fact that uh, everything what was happening, especially after 2015 and after all these crises with migration and everything and populist movements which reason in Europe, they've got to consolidate themselves so to find the unique voice which will be much more stronger. In that sense, I do believe that the new European Commission and the new president, which um, I had the privilege to work with while she was Minister of Defense in Germany, will be very efficient in uh, proving and showing, showing how important it is to go further with the enlargement in a way, of course, which will be consolidated the process. We have nothing against that. What we do need is uh, international community at the first place, European Union, be present in the region of Western Balkans, for example, just to ensure that these countries are continuing to develop uh, on the way which is related with building democracy, strengthening rule of law, freedom of media, and uh, the other values which are related with the real democratic societies. Ah, uh, yeah, of course. So that's what I uh, tried to explain. There was a lot of discussions about that, whether PESCO is something which could be considered as a competition to NATO and whether it came at some point when uh, we did have from this part of Atlantic some kind of uh, statements which were putting into consideration the efficiency of, efficiency of NATO. You do remember some statements uh, saying about NATO becoming obsolete and the things like that. So we were all actually very curious whether that might be a response to uh, this kind of uh, uh, position from uh, the United States. But then actually European states made it clear. They just wanted that to have it as a kind of a complementary to NATO. And at the first place, I would say, to ensure that on the spots where NATO as a transatlantic uh, alliance is not having priorities, they could go for their priorities. And they very well explained that uh, we already did have a couple of places where uh, it was demonstrated, like uh, Africa, like Mali, and what is going on. That was a kind of priori priority for European countries, but not for the NATO as a such. So they want to have capabilities in that sense. And what they want to do is, of course, to further on mm, develop their uh, defense industry. That is something which is, from their point of view, also important. And I do believe that uh, that is important then if it's put into uh, the function, of course, of the transatlantic alliance when it's necessary. So from that point, I believe that uh, with the majority of those countries which signed already PESCO, there is not that uh, uh, intention to go some other way. Yes, thank you, Ambassador. Um, do you think that um, the EU uh, would um, would need a um, defense treaty with the uh, UK uh, after Brexit, uh, knowing that, say, Sweden and Austria and Ireland are not part of NATO? Yeah, they are not a part of NATO, but you do know that NATO is having with them a very strong cooperation and uh, special uh, agreements which are in place. Uh, when it comes to Brexit, i got to say that we are all aware that uh, it's a kind of uh, development which is very, very difficult to see how it will be ended in a sense to go forward, of course, but uh, what the deal would be is something I think no one still knows. So when it comes to NATO, what we could hear is, is that uh, UK will remain, of course, completely committed. And from that point, it's one of the most important allies and uh, definitely a part of the deal 
with the European Union will have something to do with the defense. No one still knows what, because uh, we did have as a priority, or they did have as a priority, all these things which uh, are related with social, economical things, trade things, and uh, being very much uh, on the ease, knowing that they are in NATO also. From that point, uh, still a way to go. Hi, um, my name is Ron Nabil. I'm a second year master's student here. Um, so my question is about um, Montenegrin policy in an age of great power competition. So as you had pointed out in your excellent presentation that Montenegro, uh, sort of the rise of China and other Asian countries have interesting implications for European countries. At the same time, uh, for Montenegro in particular, um, to become part of the EU, it would need to develop in its infrastructure, but the type of countries that are sort of willing to lend money, uh, China included, for instance, the last time uh, the big project happened in 2016, Montenegro took a debt um, equal to roughly one-fifth of the country's GDP for that year, and it had rather negative implications for its um, debt sustainability. But going forward, um, how do you view Montenegro's role in balancing the interests of the United States, China, and the European Union? So when it comes to Montenegro priorities, they are completely clear. So once uh, we regained our independence, I will remind you that Montenegro in 19th century was just one of the first 47 recognized countries on the Berlin Congress. And, that's, and then we lost our independence after the First World War. And that's why I'm always insisting that in 2006, we regained our independence. So at that point, we clearly put our priorities forward, which were NATO membership and EU membership. And that is something which is not at stake at any point. And uh, I've got to say that when it comes to EU integrations, then there is a consensus in the country. When it comes to NATO, there are divergences. But again, majority is there where it is. And there is simply no circumstances under which that could be put in question. Uh, of course, one of the priorities for the government and for the state as a such was to uh, build up when it comes to infrastructure. Montenegro is uh, one of the top rising touristic destinations in the world, and we are very proud of that. But of course, we do not know to sustain uh, this kind of development trend. We do need real infrastructure. We are very proud of the fact when it comes to Mm, ICTs, when it comes to telecom and uh, information infrastructure, we are one of the leaders, not only in the region, but in Europe as well. We did that on time. And we that, did that really uh, with um, very much of involvement of all the professionals and the government uh, led that way. But when it comes to the physical infrastructure, there are issues. And one of the very important issues uh, are the roads and the highways. Uh, there, of course, uh, we would prefer to have the partners which would be our natural partners, as I would say, from the West, from the Europe, from the United States. But unfortunately, a lack of inter interest of investors from the West opened a space for some others. It's all decided in uh, open international public tenders. And uh, what we've got at the time, as many of the countries in the region and in Europe as well, was an offer from China for the part of our highway, which, uh, as you said, is a very challenging one from the point of uh, engaged resources, following the fact that uh, configuration of the terrain is Montenegro in that part from the south to the north is very challenging. It's very mountainous, and uh, we are at the moment building just something like 43 kilometers of that highway, which will cost more than a billion dollars because it's all viaducts, tunnels, bridges. There is nothing flat there. And um, it was Chinese who uh, are building that and still building that. They should uh, finish that by the end of the next year. But that is something which is showing how the lack of presence and lack of interest of our natural partners is opening the space for some others. I mean, you can't say that uh, 
okay, now there is no one from there, we'll stop all our development. It wouldn't be responsible action. So from that point, uh, we are uh, advocating the necessity of integrations of the presence of our allies and partners in the region, because if they are not present, then everything will be open for some others. Montenegro specifically is having a very a bad experience with everything which happened a couple of years ago when we were working on our, our NATO membership. You do know that in, the, in that time after the Ukraine crisis and everything when we faced more assertive Russia, that one of the spots where Russia was showing the interest to fill the gaps or just to undermine European Union or NATO was Montenegro. And we did have that fortunately unsuccessful coup d'etat, which was unsuccessful. I was there at the time. I firmly believe because of the fact that uh, on the way to integrate to NATO, we build up our capabilities so good that even the small country, we were able to give the right responses and to prevent any kind of bad consequences. So having our own experience with everything which uh, means disinformation, hackers, uh, different propaganda, we were able to show to other allies, even in NATO, what we were talking about. Because a lot of them didn't understand beforehand. Because they didn't expect. They just didn't foresee where it could be going further on. So from that point, I believe that uh, we will be working further on together with the others to show to our partners how important it is to be in that part of the world. Thank you very much, Master. And I have two very quick questions. One is, what do you see as the role of India um, in, in NATO and in, in uh, the European project, politically and economically and militarily? Um, and second is um, whether you see that um, the growing influence of Russia and China uh, in filling in some of the vacuum that US-led initiatives, let's call it broadly initiatives or engagements um, in, throughout Eurasia. Uh, do you see that as a context? And if that is so, then uh, it's not uh, a, a simple, simply a story of uh, a, lack of a lack of interest from the West in investing in certain regions. It's actually there are social transformations and changes and wars that leave uh, this, this kind of vacuum. And if that is so, then US actions in Eurasia leaves room for Russian Chinese influence, leaving uh, a, 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 a legacy and a, a, an aftermath for uh, European countries. And so do you see uh, there be a more robust role for uh, European countries uh, in terms of uh, decision makings in, 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 uh, before? Uh, these these engagements from the U.S. So um, I mean, so that that is um, it does NATO should should NATO have a more robust presence in terms of uh, collaborating um, with the U.S. Uh, and thinking long terms of Eurasian security and and maybe exercising more prudence uh, in these cases. Thank you. Well, India is one of those Asian countries which is growing so fast with uh, uh, resources which are considerable. And uh, I do believe that uh, on a bilateral level, each of the countries, including my own, are trying to get uh, into closer cooperation because uh, really resources are great there and uh, they are our size. Uh, when it comes to something structured, then uh, India is, of course, a partner of NATO as well for some of these spots we mentioned before, uh, which um, what is, I would say, a kind of uh, uh, advantage when we are talking about India is that, of course, uh, being uh, the biggest democracy in the world, uh, no one is doubtful when it comes to uh, 
uh, the goals and uh, ways how they are uh, providing uh, democracy for their own citizens. So that is a kind of a big guarantee when you come into the relations with India and it is of course uh, perceived as a great partner in that part of the world. Uh, what is not the case with the other big power from Asia. And uh, you probably have seen as well that on this, this meeting we had the other day in London that NATO in all countries agreed on the declaration where they mentioned China for the first time. So that is uh, actually the real demonstration on the, what is perceived as something that uh, NATO should be having an eye on. So for the time being is just that, apart from everything which is going on in technology and 5G and of course security threats which are related with that and where all NATO countries are completely on the same line. On the other side, of course, uh, what NATO did and the European Union, in the first place NATO, it's a defensive alliance. <coughs> so in all this, what is happening, uh, it's defense and the other component is deterrence. So what has been decided is to be more active in deterrence, hoping that it will help in uh, keeping the peace on European and uh, American continent as a such. So when you see the actions, first of all, it is that enhanced presence, which is at the borders, uh, you will see that actually it is about deterrence in the first place. And for the time being, it is sending the right messages and uh, of course, having in mind that uh, capability of the quick adaptation, we do hope that it will be no use for that, but still, if it's necessary, then there are things in place, as this is this uh, uh, new uh, forces for the quick response as well. So actually, I would say that in the last four years, NATO did much more than in the previous maybe 25, which is an assurance for all of us, I believe. Um, well, thank you so much. Um, we're actually going to wrap up now. Uh, there's a reception upstairs, and you're welcome to uh, speak with the ambassador up there as well. Thank you for coming, and please thank me. Uh, I mean, yeah, thank you, thank ambassador. You.